Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. This is the Conversation Cafe series, What's Happening with Recycling. I'm John Brooker. I'm with MUSC Sustainability and Recycling. I should tell you briefly before we begin what we do and why we hold these. So we work in sustainability here at the Medical University. We have initiatives in recycling and waste management, energy and water, food, transportation, climate, and green building. And topics that we have are in these categories throughout the year. Every month, usually the first Wednesday of the month. And if you want to hear more about events like these, um, we have a green team email list sign up, which is at the front on that clipboard. You can also sign up on our website at musc.edu slash go green and our social media channels. We'll also have this seminar recorded. Um, we'll have the screen capture and the audio from this session. And that'll be on our YouTube channel in about a week or two. And so you can share that with anyone that wasn't able to make it today. And we're also on MUSC's internal social media, Yammer. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alec Cooley, who's our guest today. He is a recycling expert, a consultant with Bush Systems, and has had a long career in recycling. Alec, did I miss anything? I was, I was a director of recycling programs for the National Food and Energy Office for about 10 years. Um, and I got my start, actually, um, I got my start running the recycling program for a state university in California for about 10 years, many years ago. Um, so thank you. Um, before I start, quick show of hands. Who here are recyclers? Raise your hand. Awesome. Good. That's what I want to hear. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, um, there, there are a couple things. There's been a lot of media stories recently about problems with recycling. It's all getting thrown away, something about China, uh, contamination. What I want to do is, is sort of peel back, you know, pull back the curtain and talk a little bit about the recycling industry itself and give some context to some of the news stories you're hearing. Um, talk about why recycling is still very much alive, still very relevant, and something that um, that makes a difference. And then, um, and then we'll set aside some time just to talk about some of the really confusing things. Just um, I know a lot of folks have questions: what can and can't be recycled. Um, but to get started, um, I want to talk about sort of the background, the history of recycling. Without going into the deep past, recycling was always something that was very much embedded into our culture, simply because. Those are resources, and that had a value, and you wanted to save that. Um, I think many of us are familiar with World War II. There was a really intense effort to, cap, you know, to capture twine, everything, steel, anything that could be recycled, because that helped the war effort. You go into the 1950s, you have the rise of the consumer culture. The message changed to, don't worry, just make it convenient. You can just toss it out. And we moved away from that recycling mentality um, and that only started to change again in the early 1970s with the first Earth Day when people started to think of this in terms of environmental benefits. Um, and, and so that's kind of what gets us into the modern era. Really, the thing that precipitated recycling as a modern movement was in the mid-80s. The U.S. EPA passed regulations that for the first time started to regulate landfills. You had to now start lining them. You had to do all these other things to make sure that they were were polluting the groundwater in other areas. That raised the costs of a landfill, and all of a sudden a lot of landfills started closing because they didn't meet the requirements, and that led to this crisis. We did not have enough landfills. We had to save the landfills. And one viable option that people looked to was recycling. Let's divert that material somewhere else. And so that, I, I make that distinction because that's really what have been the main drivers that's fed all these recycling programs and efforts over the last 30, 40 years is, what do we do with this stuff? we got to make it go somewhere. The focus has not so much been on the value of the material, the resource that it used to be way, way back. Um, as I'll point to as we go along, that's starting to shift again um, as, as the industry changes and as, um, as, as climate changes kick again and we start to look at, at finite resources, there's, there's a changing dynamic. But first, I just want to point out, show here how we have um, just an example of what recycling looked like back in the 1980s. I have a little I recycle pin for the person who remembers what that is, this barge here. Does anybody? It was, so this, this was the barge. It was actually called the Mobro 4000. And then... <laughs> Um, this was a barge that was filled with trash and it was sent from New York down, it was going to go to North Carolina, to 
the landfill there and arrived. North Carolina said, we don't want your trash, New York. And so they said, keep moving. This barge kept going down the coast. It passed South Carolina. It kept looking for places all the way down to Florida to take the trash. They couldn't find a taker. They kept going to Mexico. They made it all the way down to Central America before they realized it had become a huge media story. This was in all the front page papers tracking the progress of this one barge as it went down to Central America. It eventually came back up to New York, uh, where it was incinerated, but it became the poster child of this landfill crisis, what to do with trash. Um, in the 1980s, 90s, you had these curbside programs that developed where we kept everything separate into different tubs, all glass went into one tub, aluminum paper into separate tubs, and that was how the whole system was, was designed. It was very much focused on basic materials, cans, bottles, paper, cardboard. And I point that out again because today recycling is much more expansive. This what we think of as recycling um, means much more than it used to be. We now have much more modern systems where we have a single cart that most folks are familiar with, certainly here in Charleston County. Um, what can be recycled is dramatically increased. We, can, we recycle things like computers now. Carpets can be recycled. Uh, construction demolition material, batteries, all sorts of things that previously we didn't think of in those terms can now be recycled. Uh, we have a lot more focus now on organics, composting material, because that's a big source of waste that goes to the landfill and a source of methane. Um, the other thing I make a distinction is that um, corporate America is much more invested in recycling now than it used to be. It used to be where a company would say, well, we'll use recycled or whatever. It was much more of a greenwashing marketing opportunity. Today, companies like Coca-Cola, Alcoa, other companies that use packaging are looking for feedstock for where their material is going to come, and they see a future of finite resources. And so they're starting to get much more involved in recycling systems than uh, previously. The final thing I would, I would point out is with this lower right-hand corner where we show see the, the plastic bottles, another thing that you're seeing is with packaging design is changing so that not only to, to make it recyclable, but also what's called lightweighting. Um, designing things so that there's less actual material in it so that um, we're, we're consuming less. Um, and and if, if you hold up a bottle that was created 30 years ago versus one today, you can just crush it in your hands now. And you couldn't do that before, and that's, that's because of that light waiting process. So with, with limited time, I want to at least quickly walk you through the basic stages of what it means to recycle. We start with what all of us do personally in our home and in our office, we put things into recycling bins. That goes to a MRF, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, so a material recycling recovery facility, uh, where it gets bailed and processed into the different types of material. It then goes to another stage where it gets processed into a feedstock material that can then be used to make a new bottle, a new box, whatever that new product is. What you see there in the second from left or second from right is actual recycled plastic that's been pelletized. So that's now the material that's going to be used to make new bottles. So, material recovery facility, um, these are, um, it depends from one location to the next around the country, but this is typically where the truck that goes by your house next goes to one of these facilities. They dump everything out, and it goes through, um, in many cases, a very high-tech process. Um, as I said, it depends from one location to the next, but, um, but briefly, um, in every, again, every facility is different, but oftentimes you will have, um, there'll be a sort line where you have individuals who will pick out some materials. Then it goes to the far right-hand corner where you can see, that's, that's called a star screen. That's a um, mechanized process that can, that can separate materials into the different kinds of things based on the, 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 um, the, the, how, how much they weigh, or the, if they're one-dimensional, two-dimensional. Those are all um, mechanized processes that can sort things that way in a very high-tech we're just now, in the last year or two, we're starting to see robotics coming into recycling. So you actually have the lower left-hand corner, we have a, a robotic arm that there's an optical eye that can look at that material. Not only can it tell it's a plastic bottle, it can tell what kind of plastic it is, and it can, at the speed of light, move things around and sort things. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a becoming a very high-tech um, industry. And at the end, it creates the bells, similar um, to what I showed with the plastic that, that goes to processing in the next stage. What does recycling get turned into? Many things. Um, just a couple examples with paper. It can be turned into you know, boxes, can be turned into new boxes. Um, basically anything that's made out of paper can be made out of recycled content and is in many cases. Uh, similar with metals, um, aluminum can be made to make a new airplane. 
the steel cables that hold up the Cooper River Bridge and all likely have probably have recycled steel in that. Uh, uh, steel and aluminum are probably the two most recycled items and virtually everything you buy has some recycled content in it. Uh, plastics, plastics are a lot more complex, but you know, um, a high level, things like plastic bags, a film plastic, um, that can be made into a plastic lumber to make a new bench. Um, obviously, you can turn that into new bottles. Even like the insides of cars, the plastic console on your dashboard and all, a lot of that has recycled content in it now. You can make carpets um, out of old PET bottles. So um, there are many things that you can do with plastics. Um, and then glass, you know, this is another example, um, fiberglass. Think about the glass in that. You can make fiberglass out of old bottles. Uh, you can um, asphalt. You can actually take crushed glass and put that in, mix that in with with asphalt, um, and it makes road beds that, in many ways, has better properties. It grips the tire better than the normal asphalt. Um, you can make, make fiberglass uh, roofing tiles, and then I point this out on the right hand side. This is a glass countertop that's that's made with recycled glass and epoxy, and that's, that was actually done by. Um, there's a company here in Charleston, Fisher Recycling, that that does that and sells those. So how are we doing with recycling? In this country, um, you know, starting on the, the right-hand side, we recycle roughly 34% of all the, the waste that, that is generated every year gets recycled. Um, the EPA estimates probably up to 75% of everything we generate could conceivably be recycled as it stands. Um, so we still have a long ways to go, and we've been plateaued at that rate for over a decade now. Uh, we, we were very successful in improving recycling programs, but it's stalled over the last 10, 15 years. And, and I'll talk a little bit more what's uh, behind that in a moment. Um, but just also for comparison, you can see how we're doing in South Carolina and here in Charleston. I know um, Sloan, I think, is going to talk in a few minutes about what uh, MEOC is doing with its recycling. But as we all know, there's troubles on the horizon. We've all seen you know, that the New York Times had a front page story, uh, NPR, the Atlantic Monthly have all had stories talking about these, these big issues that are going on that are causing recycling to die or, or to fail. Um, and and there, there are two primary things that are driving this right now. One is, uh, has to do with international markets. So in currently, for the last 10, 20, 30 years, increasingly, as manufacturing has moved out of the United States to China, the material you need to manufacture new things has also followed that. And so whereas we used to have a lot more pulp mills, a lot more manufacturing facilities here in the U.S. that would take that scrap material, that's, those have tended to move to China and to other Southeast Asian countries. Um, the second big issue that I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment is with contamination, where we have a lot of material that is not recyclable that's getting mixed in, and that's been going to China for a long time, and they've tolerated it, but in the last year, they've said, we don't want that stuff anymore. Um, in fact, we're just going to stop taking it all together. And so uh, in December of 2017, they announced a policy that over a couple of years um, into 2020 will eventually result in them not accepting any scrap material at all from outside countries. Um, and, and I emphasize the word scrap. They don't want this is stuff that comes out of the immerse directly, but they will accept the material that has been reprocessed. So you, I showed you those pellets, plastic pellets. They still want that because they still need material to make new things. They just don't want the junk anymore. Um, so recycling is driven by commodity markets. The, the, the economics of how recycling works um, in many cases are driven by that, and so that's leading to real turmoil as, uh, as it creates a glut of material that they won't accept. We have to find new homes for that material. Um, contamination is, is the other significant problem. And what's, what's happening with this is, you, I talked earlier about how in the 80s, 90s, we had a system where you separated everything into different tubs. There was much more focus on make sure it's the right material that goes in there, and things were relatively clean. We, for a number of reasons, we shifted over the last de few decades to the single stream concept where you put it all into one bin, and that's because it makes it much more convenient. It also reduces the cost to collect materials, so there are a lot of benefits to having that system. It's led to a dramatic increase in the amount of material that gets recycled, 
But the problem is, with that came this change in sort of the mentality and the messaging of what we as recyclers communicated out to everybody else that, don't worry, just put it in there. That's the main thing is just recycle more. And we blurred that distinction, the fact that there are some things that cannot be recycled. And so that's part of how we put ourselves in the situation as it stands now. Another problem is that I think for a lot of folks, there's kind of that gray area, what I, we call wishful recycling. Um, I know some plastics can be recycled. I'm not sure if this one can be, but if I put it in there, there's always a chance it could be. So I'm going to hope it gets recycled. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, it's not recyclable, and that becomes a big problem. Um, the, 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 the final thing I would observe about what causes contamination is when we start mixing everything into one truck, glass bottles with paper and other things, just that process of actually collecting and, and handling the material, when a bottle gets broken, you get glass shards all mixed in with paper, that degrades that material, and it makes it so it's much harder to recycle. So those are the different forms that contamination come in, um, and it's become a big problem. A couple other just ongoing challenges beyond simply those two immediate issues, but that we've been facing for a number of years. One is just with, with the, the economic model of recycling. There, there are two primary ways that recycling gets paid for. One is through the service fees that you pay to have it collected. Um, in Charleston County, we pay that as part of our annual user, um, user fee. Uh, the other is from selling the material, as I mentioned. The problem is that um, in both cases, they have to compete against outside forces. When it comes to the, um, the cost to uh, the, the, the user fees, there's always the option of sending it to the landfill. And in our case, that tends to be more expensive, and so it makes sense to recycle. But, um, but landfills are not very expensive, especially in the southeast, and sometimes it tips the balance where it's cheaper to send it to a landfill. Um, so that, that's one problem that can create um, challenges. The other is that you can only sell a scrap plastic to a remanufacturer for about the amount of what it would otherwise cost to, to drill oil and produce virgin plastic. Um, so when the price of oil goes down, that manufacturers are going to look for the cheapest material, they're going to go for the virgin material. And so that makes it also difficult for recycling to compete at times. And all these are, you know, these are, these are market forces, and like all markets, they go up and down. And certainly the situation with China has resulted in the value of most recycling scrap materials has gone down dramatically over the last year and a half. That's starting to correct and come back in some cases, but it's going to be a years-long process to, um, to address that. The second issue I would point to is the lack of coordination. There's, there's two different sides to the recycling industry. There are those on the municipal level, a local hauler, um, those of us on the, the ground level, and our job is trying to get material and keep it out of the landfill and push it into the system to see that it gets handled in a different direction. But ultimately, this being driven by a need to, um, to eliminate um, material going to the landfill. On the flip side of it, you have the manufacturers. They just simply want good quality material. And they don't really care if it's going to the landfill or not because they'll go get virgin material if they need to. So those are two different sets of goals, and they don't always coordinate. Um, and that, that results in, a, in problems. The, um, the final thing I would point out here is just a lack of leadership. On the federal level, the U.S. EPA has resources. They will help programs uh, with, with advice, best practices, but there's no laws. There, there's nothing that really requires recycling or creates standards. On a state level, it's very patchwork. California and some of the West Coast states have strict laws. Um, California has to reach a 75% diversion rate in the next few years. South Carolina, we don't have that. Um, and so... Um, in California, the recycling rate is 65% currently. As you saw here, we're down closer to 30. So um, that's another challenge that we have. So to just skip along, um, as I said, this has had a big effect. Um, in different communities, you've seen recycling programs cut back what materials they will accept. In other cases, three examples where they're just having to eliminate the recycling programs altogether. Um, it does not happen very often, but there are rare instances where material that's collective recycling ends up going to the landfill simply because they, they, they can't find a market. There's nobody they can sell it to. Um, that, that doesn't happen very often, though. The important thing is that recycling is not going away. This is a multi-billion dollar international industry, 
Um, it's going through a market fluctuation right now, but there is strong economic drivers for why recycling is still important and why it will continue and, and rebound. I'll point out just a couple. On the environment, there, there are two really important things about recycling. One is that not only are you diverting, you're, you're, you're preventing the need to drill new for new oil. So if we don't want to see this off our coast here, recycling is one way that we help reduce the demand for, for, uh, for that or for mining, uh, for logging, other, other extraction processes. The other is with greenhouse gas emissions. Um, when you send material to the landfill, it, it's, um, it's capped and it's, they keep, the, um, it, it's called an anaerobic process where you don't want things to decompose because there's no oxygen. When it does decompose, it turns into methane. Um, organic food turns into methane in the landfill. Methane is 22, 23 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So, um, so that's another way that we help prevent that by, uh, by recycling. Uh, recycling is huge for the economy in this country and even here in South Carolina. Just a couple stats. Um, there are anywhere from 10 to 20 jobs are created for every, when you recycle, for one job created when you send something to the landfill. So that's a huge multiplier of, of, of job creation. In the U.S. alone, there are 757,000, 100,000 jobs that are directly related to the recycling industry. South Carolina, there are 22,000 jobs directly supported by recycling. In, um, nationally, recycling generates $36 billion in wages every year. So that's a big deal for the economy. Um, and that's, that's $13 billion in here in South Carolina. That is both paying the people who do the actual physical collecting, but we also do have manufacturing. Um, we, there's um, a lot of uh, carpet, um, other plastics recycling um, industries here in South Carolina and Georgia area that are supported by this. Yeah. Great. How much time do I have roughly? So I can... Okay. Great. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, so why is it so confusing? Um, this is one that um, I, no matter how, you know, I, I work in the industry, I've done it for 25 plus years, I still get confused about certain things. And there are a couple reasons of why that is. One is, it, it, actually, I'll back up. An important thing to know is that virtually everything is recyclable in theory. If, if humans manufacture something, they can figure out how to remanufacture it from something else. The problem is, how do you do that economically? And so at the end of the day, something, something may be recyclable, but it's only acceptable into a system if that system has an economic way of managing and, and handling that material. And that's a big part of why some materials are recyclable, some materials aren't uh, when we communicate. Um, some of that is economic, as I said, but some of it's also technological. And a good example would be plastic bags are very recyclable. They can be turned into plastic lumber, but technologically, they create problems when you put it, go through these material recovery facilities because they, they're so light they fly around and they get caught in the gears and it will shut the whole system down. So it can be collected, you just can't put it into your curbside bin. So, um, so I'll talk through high level some of the, the takeaways that you should know about what's recyclable and what isn't. When we get, uh, I'll hold for right now questions, but when we get to the end, we'll, we'll definitely set aside time to answer some of those. Um, this is an example of what I just talked about. Those are all plastic bags that are caught in the gears of a facility. In some cases, they might have to shut down a facility multiple times in a single day and spend 45 minutes with guys with box covers trying to cut all those off. Um, so that, that's a huge problem. Um, and that, so that's one thing to know is with your, whatever you put in the bin, not only store-bought bags, not just throwing them in there, but if you're collecting things in your home with a, paper, with a plastic bag, don't just toss that whole bag in. You want to empty out the contents and keep the bag out of, of the, blue, the blue bin. Um, there is a whole website that talks all about the very specifics of what kinds of film, plastic we call it, can be recycled. Um, it's called plastic filmrecycling.org. Um, uh, we're starting to see a lot of these types of packaging that are not really a rigid bottle. And they're not really a bag either. They're kind of this in-between. We prefer them as plastic or flexible plastics. Um, this is another material that in theory is recyclable. Probably 10 years from now will be, but they haven't figured out the technology for how to get it through the system and collect it efficiently. 
So this is, again, something you don't want to be putting into your bin currently. Um, styrofoam, uh, non-container, plastics. Um, generally, you want to focus on bottles and, and containers with, with the lid that are rigid. That's really the main materials that are plastic that are recyclable. But all these other ones, styrofoam, um, anything that can get tangled up into a system you want to be leaving out. Uh, some paper is recyclable, some is not. As a general rule, if it's something that is designed, paper designed to actually touch food and packaging, it's probably not recyclable. The reason is that when it touches food, you don't want, you have to put in a, a thin layer of plastic that keeps the paper from absorbing water from the food. And that thin layer of plastic makes it difficult to recycle. Um, the other thing is, is tissues. Um, paper towels, they're just such a low quality, it can't, it, it falls apart before it can go through the system again. Um, and this, this is an important one. Um, when, when things go through the system, I showed you the star screen and how they use mechanized process to, to sort things. Um, they do that by, a, they're able to figure out, is it three-dimensional, this object, or is it flat? And to based on those qualities, it will sort things in different ways. But, can or bottle smash like this, it's treated like paper. So it tends to get sorted into the paper side. So again, very recyclable, but, um, but, but it can't go through the system. Uh, most often, it, it won't get through the system as it stands. And this is one, personally, I started out driving forklift and doing working in the MRF when I was a college student. Um, and there's nothing inherently about dairy that makes it unrecyclable, but it's really nasty. So um, take, have, have a, it's a humanitarian mesh measure, um, rinse, rinse those out. Um, other things that you can do, you know, beyond just being knowledgeable and making sure you know what can and can't be recycled, um, you know, reducing what we consume in the first place is real important. Marine plastics is a huge, huge issue. Um, you know, I think there's been a lot of press about uh, bans on bags and straws in the area. Um, those are all things that you can, if you don't need them, there's no reason to, to accept them. Um, these, these pods, the K-cups or the, the, the little Keurig cups, um, that's another example where we've kind of, we, we've been conditioned to, it's easy, it's convenient, and so it's okay. But again, this is something, the plastic is recyclable, but when it goes to that whole process, these things are so small, they just fall right through the gears. So typically, those aren't going to get recycled. Um, even if you tear them apart. Even if you tear them apart, unfortunately. Um, and it's just a, it's a process of there's so many gaps and literally cracks that they can fall through. Um, they're, they're hard to get through. Um, and I would point out just the obvious, which is it still works to use a percolator or a coffee pot, other systems that don't even generate that source of waste in the first place. Um, something that does not get talked a lot but is becoming a bigger issue is food waste. As I mentioned, food, when it's in the landfill, it turns into methane, which is a, a huge problem. Um, and these, these are some pretty sobering uh, stats here. 40% of all the food we produce in this country goes in the trash. Um, that, that should be shocking, um, especially juxtaposed against the fact that there are 37, um, there are 40 million Americans every year who are facing hunger in some form. So we have a real disconnect between how we're allocating resources. Um, there are... Uh, I won't go in depth, but I'll just point out that there, there's an ad campaign that the uh, NRDC is doing called Save the Food that has a lot of practical resources and tips on how you can eliminate food waste in your own home. Things like how to um, efficiently manage things in the refrigerator so things don't go bad before you have a chance to eat them. How to understand the save or the use by dates, because those could be confusing. Um, there are a lot of good resources there. Um, and then I'll close with... Um, with a request that, that everybody make a commitment for how you can personally become more involved and go beyond what you're already doing right now. Um, saving resources requires a personal commitment from all of us. Um, these are just a couple examples. Um, and with that, I'm going to pause because I know we have a couple additional speakers. Uh, do we all save questions for the end? Or? Yeah, so uh, a round of applause for Alec. Thank you. Real quick aside, so um, Sloan and I, Sloan will be coming up in a minute, but we work for MUSC Sustainability and Recycling. To his point, um, we actually have a plastic bag recycling bin 
right here in the lobby here. So if you work here at MUSC, feel free to use that and either there or the grocery store. Now I'm gonna bring up Christina Moskos with Charleston County. She's gonna tell you about what's happening here in our county. Thank you, Christina. Thanks. Hey everybody. So Alec just gave a fantastic overview of kind of the state of recycling. I definitely don't want to recreate the wheel here. So I'll just be quick. I just want to share a little bit about what we in Charleston County are doing to combat one of the biggest challenges facing the recycling industry currently, which is contamination. So just a little brief um, background, just some stats on Charleston County. So um, the Environmental Management Department, we essentially handle all of the solid waste that's generated here in the county. Our largest program is our residential single stream recycling program. We service about 135,000 households on a two-week service schedule. Um, that number is growing every day. I mean, we um, are constantly getting calls with new construction homes, people moving into the county that are requesting a recycling cart. Um, we also have a commercial program to service local businesses. We service about 3,500 businesses, about 350 apartment and condominium complexes. We also have a greening schools program where we service 100% of Charleston County School District schools. And we also have a special events recycling program where we lend out bins to any event going on here in the county. Um, Alec briefly mentioned food waste composting and the county does have a commercial grade composting facility out in West Ashley where we accept food waste uh, from local generators like restaurants, grocery stores, cafeterias, and places like MUSC. Um, and we are able to recycle that into a compost product that we sell back to the community. So contamination, you know, like Alec mentioned, with the shift a couple years ago from a dual stream program to a single stream program, while it, you know, did a lot of positive things for recycling, it um, doubled tonnage that we receive, it more than doubled participation by making it a lot simpler and more convenient for residents, it did kind of create this wishful recycling problem. Um, you know, people are just putting anything and everything into that blue bin at the curb without really thinking about where it's going. So these are some, you know, actual photos of what we find in carts at the curbs, curb here in Charleston County. Um, a lot of people put, put food waste in their cart. That is obviously a big no-no. Um, right here in the bottom left-hand corner, that's the flexible plastic packaging that Alec mentioned that we unfortunately cannot accept. Um, one of the biggest things we're pushing right now is encouraging residents not to bag their recyclables before placing material into the cart. We just want everything loose into the cart. And so obviously this is an example of what not to do. Um, another big contaminant for us at the recycling center are what we call tanglers. And that's kind of any cord-like items you'll see over here on the right. It looks like some cables or cords. Um, we get garden hoses, belts, Christmas lights, anything that is rope-like, don't put into your recycling container. Um, over here on the right side, those are just some of the biggest contaminants that we are currently experiencing. Um, we really, in most municipal programs, we're really just looking for the standard household recyclables that you're generating, the bottles, cans, paper, cardboard, things like that. Um, yes, absolutely. This shredded paper, Charleston County can't accept it in their household bins. MUSC, we have our own shred truck. We shred about 20,000 pounds of paper a week for MUSC. Right. And again, you know, the big reason why we are looking to decrease contamination rates are because it, it does pose a processing issue for us. Um, you know, the bags, for example, can clog up the machines. Um, you know, a lot of these tanglers and things like that can pose worker safety issues. Um, recently, we had an entire golf bag full of golf clubs come through the sort line. Luckily, they were able to pull it off before it got to the machines. But, you know, I mean, that could definitely create a safety issue. So, you know, it's it's wishful recycling like that. I'm sure someone thought, hey, this is metal. It can be recycled. But no, we're really just looking for the aluminum cans, tin cans, steel cans, that sort of thing. <laughs> it still had the golf towel attached and everything. So quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we are working pretty hard right now to try to address contamination. Um, we're working to create some educational flyers that 
um, ex, you know, address not only what you should recycle, but more so now the things that we don't want you to recycle. Um, we are trying to do, you know, make a, have a bigger community presence. We're doing more HOA presentations, school presentations, things like that, to try to communicate this information to our residents. Um, we also have these nice cart tags that say oops on them. Um, our drivers use these when they move contamination at the curb. It actually has a little, they can um, check a box so that the resident will know what contamination was noted in their cart. And we follow that up with a mailed letter that contains educational information, um, you know, just nicely requesting that they try to pull that material out and um, avoid it next time. And then just a, a quick um, touch on our recycling center here in Charleston. Right now, we are still processing at our Romney Street MRF materials recovery facility. We recently constructed a large covered building. It's about 10,000 square feet, and its purpose is to protect the recyclable material from the elements so that um, the material content doesn't get degraded before we have a chance to process it. But as Alec mentioned, our um, recycling center is a series of um, machines and a combination of the um, rotors and blowers and screens, so the machine sorting as well as hand sorting. So we do want to kind of keep the material clean before it gets to this facility. Um, we are sorting material there and bailing it and then selling it to different markets. These are the main commodities that we are currently selling. And this is a rendering of Charleston County's new uh, materials recovery facility that is being planned for Palmetto Commerce Parkway. It's about 85,000 square feet. And um, it'll include city-of-the-art technology, so definitely a lot more advanced than what we currently have at Romney Street. Um, it will include educational space, we'll be hosting tours, and it will co-locate our administration staff with our collection staff and make everyone's life a whole lot easier. So I believe, yeah, that those are all the slides that I have. And if you guys have any questions specific to Charleston County, um, what we're doing, you know, within the county, you can ask them at the end once everyone has spoken. Yeah, we're going to have one more quick presentation, just a couple slides from Sloan Reeves. He's our recycling coordinator here at USC. I'm going to pull that up. Also, a round of applause for Christina. Thank you, Christina. So who here at MUSC thinks we do not have any contamination? <laughs> right. So we've talked about national and international, and we've talked about the county a little bit. Now we're going to focus in on our own community here at MUSC um, for a couple of slides. Um, as John alluded to, my name is Sloan Reeves. I'm the recycling supervisor, coordinator on campus. I lead a team of um, one office member and um, seven collection um, uh, truck drivers and collectors that go in all of our buildings on campus, or also our buildings off campus where we do our paper shredding for the MUSC family. Um, and some of those uh, teammates are here in the room with us today. Um, just to talk a little bit about the different materials that we collect on campus here, um, we'll start off with what our team calls uh, PGM. We call it plastics, glass, metal. Those are traditionally the blue 23-gallon um, Slim Jims that you'll see on campus. The bodies are blue and the lids are blue, and most of them have holes in it. For your plastic containers. Um, we also collect um, plastic bags as John said here in the library is the only sole location for your single-use plastic bag collection. Um, I will also mention that you know some supermarkets such as Harris Teeter and Publix will take your single-use plastic bags um, and you can drop them off there. Um, we also collect all paper on campus whether you have a gray body green top Slim Jim also 23 gallons, or whether you have a 30 gallon confidential bin, or if you have one of our big blues on four wheels. All paper that we collect on campus gets shredded, um, as Christine said, by one of our two shred trucks, and then we take that material to a local vendor. Um, we also uh, partner with our custodial and EVS um, staff um, for the recycling of the cardboard. Um, it's most of the time um, broken down, hopefully, and uh, placed near your trash cans um, for uh, that team to come by and collect. 
Um, we do a special route on Tuesdays, um, and we actually have a route where we go in high volume areas, and we also accept work orders um, to collect e-waste, um, toner, and batteries, and that's on Tuesdays. Um, so if you have um, the need for a battery collection and you need a battery container, you can submit that request by calling uh, 24119, um, uh, and they'll do a work order. And if the volume is there enough for you to actually be added on that every Tuesday route, um, then we can add you on that as well. Scott, yes? Can you request that it be You can. Okay, well, um, so we take e waste It's on our website as well. Yeah, we can't take computers. We can't take the big things. Those things should have a surplus tag and they all have to go to the I just want to make that distinction. And my team, when we come to pick up your e-waste, if you've asked for an e-waste bin to be dropped off, we are supposed to actually look in the bin to see if it's acceptable material. And if it is, of course, we take it. If it's not, then we're supposed to tell you that it's not acceptable and then you have to sort through it and try to get down to what is acceptable, and then we'll, we'll of course, come back and get it. Um, compost. We have a great compost program on campus. It started over a year, working on a year and a half ago. Um, right now, our compost program um, is in the library here. There are several bins. Uh, we also have bins in um, the um, basic science building, drug discovery lobby, and bioengineering lobbies. Um, we're trying to expand that program across campus. As Alex said, um, you know, food waste going in um, to the regular waste beds and then ending up in the landfill is really, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's not a good thing. We need to try to divert that waste, divert that weight from going to the landfill and, um, and having to pay for that uh, material to go there. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you can ask them at the end, but compost doesn't necessarily only talk about food or leftover food. It also talks about, and we also include any compostable materials um, are accepted in those bins as well. Correct. Um, a little bit more, but I just kind of got ahead of myself. Um, uh, but uh, last year, just to give you an idea, we diverted 193,616 pounds um, from January, the whole calendar year in 2018. And that's a good job. I mean, everybody give our campus a hand. Um, you know, we're definitely trying to even go above and beyond that as we expand our program into different, more high volume areas, certain break rooms, certain um, buildings that have, you know, more events in them and stuff like that. We're trying to capture as much material and strategize the placement um, of the bins. How often are those picked up? Um, those are picked up. They're, they're supposed to be picked up every day, every weekday. There's not a holiday. How much? <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, every every weekday. Um, some bragging rights, um, just to give uh, some. Um, some information about some poundage that we have recycled during the year of 2018. Um, you can see it. I'll read it to you. Almost, almost 840,000 pounds of cardboard was recycled. And all of this, is, as I say recycled, all of this weight is also kept from going to the landfill. So it keeps the USC from having to pay for that extra weight to go to the landfill. So it's also a huge savings when we have this diversion of material. Um, office paper, a little over 800,000 pounds. Scrap metal, almost 250,000. E-waste, um, near 114,000. Plastic glass metal, almost 105,000. Toner, almost 12. And batteries, a little over 10. Um, a little bit more. Um, every year, um, from I'm not sure how many years back, probably close to 10 years or so, um, MUSC has uh, competed in a nationwide um, college and university comp recycling competition called Recycle Mania. Um, and these numbers below uh, tell you where we actually came in um, the, uh, the competition this year. It normally runs from about the middle of January till about the end of March. So it's only about a two and a half month period. But we came in 20th out of 73 participating um, college and universities in paper, 43rd out of 72 
in plastic, glass, metal, sixth out of 89 in cardboard, um, and 12th out of 43 um, for e-waste. So again, you know, we are doing well in what we do on campus. And that's all I have, and now we can open it up for questions, however we're going to do that. Or stand up, please. Yeah. Please stand up. Yeah.